Um, so I am thrilled to welcome everyone to our green quarantine learning session. We are the Broadway Green Alliance. Uh, we have a mission to motivate, educate, and inspire the entire theater community and its patrons to adopt environmentally friendlier practices. And we'll be doing that here today, specifically taking a look at our design studios and our model making. And I'm thrilled to learn uh, from Danielle here today. So without further ado, I am excited to introduce you to Danielle Worley. Uh, she, her, and um, she is a designer of sets and gardens, is an activist and an educator. And um, it is an honor to get to learn from you today, Danielle. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's so great. I'm going to uh, change my view here. Um, welcome. Thank you for everybody who's tuning in today. I love to see faces. It just helps me communicate to the room. So if you can turn on your video, that is fantastic. Um, later, um, what we're, how we're going to schedule this is um, I'm going to talk for about a half an hour about some techniques that I've used um, to green my practice. And then I'm gonna open up the floor and so we can all have a dialogue about this. So if you have questions, um, save your questions till then and then let's, you know, let's talk about these practices because the practices that I'm gonna show you today have worked for me. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna work for everybody. And so part of this, um, part of this process is that you, you start adapting things that work for your environment. Um, I mean, all y'all probably know you have some interest in, if you're here, you probably have some interest in, in interest in sustainability and changing your practices. So um, you're gonna, you know, you know how you work best. And um, sustainability is really about figuring out how to tailor changes in your own practice, in your own world. There's no one size fits all for this. Um, it's, it's really, it's individuals can make um, pretty substantial ch changes and choices for themselves. And so um, what I am really interested in is meeting you where you are in your practice and say, let's maybe, you know, let's, there's a, maybe think about doing it this way or, or this way. One of the things I found um, as being a, um, both, you know, being around a lot of students and then, um, being an educator myself, that we were all taught a certain way, like the right way to build a model. And um, I, you know, personally took all of that with me for years and I just did it the way I was taught. And I was taught to use foam core and I was taught to use Zappagap. Um, and I was taught to use um, uh, like all kinds of materials that aren't actually very environmentally sound. And um, so, when I sort of really got into this and started making some dramatic changes in my life in reference to to the business, I would I would go about making changes for um, sets, right? The way we built sets, but I would come back to my studio and still use foam core, and so it didn't. It, I wasn't making that connection between oh, I can make a difference in on stage, changing the materials that I used on stage, but then I would come back to my studio and I would do the same thing I always did for years. Until one day a student, maybe, I don't know, like 10 or 12 years ago, that said, what do you use for models? Like, if you don't use foam core, what do you use? And I was like, I guess I use foam core. Like, I hadn't even, it hadn't even clicked in my mind. You know, I gotta make that change and I gotta figure it out. I mean, why do I not use foam core? Foam core is um, it's a material, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. it um, each quarter inch sheet of foam core can take 50 years to biodegrade in a landfill. So like, if you think about it, and oh, and each half inch sheet can take 100 years. So every single sheet, every single off cut, every single model that you've tossed, that you've uh, finished, ends up sitting in a landfill. Um, I didn't, I couldn't, you know, sort of live like that. And so um, I started working with cardboard, which is like this. Um, I use four different types of cardboard. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna actually screen share um, real quick. I'm gonna show you the four types of substrates. I call them substrates. Um, and I'm gonna start identifying them by what they're used for mostly. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. I'm also gonna show you some of the tools that I work with. Okay, screen share here. Okay, so here are the basics. You got your ruler, a hot glue gun, glue sticks, 
gaff tape, packing tape, Elmer's glue, scotch tape, and a cutting mat. Pretty basic. These are the types of cardboards. Okay, so the first one is cereal box, very thin. Second one is pizza box, then Amazon box, and then U-Haul box. And you can see in this photograph the thicknesses of these cardboards. The first one is very similar to Bristol board. Uh, the second one, the pizza box, is not something we really have an alternative to in traditional model making. I would say this is one of my favorite materials because it's, um, it's very strong and very thin. Um, it's not as easy to find as something like an Amazon box, which everybody has millions of those. Um, however, whenever you do find this, it's, um, I, I think it's highly valuable. Um, the next one is an Amazon box, which is your traditional one, um, one ply cardboard. It's, it's um, not super strong, but it works for a lot of different applications. And the last one is the U-Haul box. That's a double thick cardboard, very strong, used for model houses, carrying cases, and all other kinds of uh, storage boxes. And also for things, um, it has a bevy of purposes in half-inch models, as you'll see. Use a lot of these Copic mod um, markers for doing the edges of things. These are the basic colors, I would say, that you, you get used all the time, sort of the neutral colors. Um, you know, more materials. I'm sure you're a lot familiar with this, this type of stuff. Scale rules, T-squares, blades, um, Sharpies, etc. Different types of knives. So when you're working with cardboard, the Ulfa uh, blades or box cutters are really great, as well as the NT cutters. Um, they're just a, a slightly different type, a little thicker of a blade. I use a lot of scotch tape, a lot of T-pins. Um, that angle plate there, use those all the time. Um, those are, uh, they're very heavy angle plates that can weight things. They can, you can use them to, um, to uh, stack things against when you're trying to set things up. They're very helpful to have in the studio. I probably use them every, every couple of days. Okay, there you go. Those were those tools. So, as I showed you before, Here's the cereal box. This was the back of the cereal box. It's very flexible. It's, it's just like Bristol board. Um, it has something on the back. So um, I always just tend to use this. Usually the other side is shiny. So when you're applying glue, the shiny side is, is not as absorb, doesn't absorb the glue as much as this side. When you're looking for more sustainable materials, think of things that are brown or sort of gray. I'm going to bring a box over here. Okay, so here's a small box. And I'll show you the kinds of things. Um, let's see, some of this is just mat board, but like this. This one is something I would call a pizza box. It's very thin. See, I'm trying to bend it and it's, it's you know, it's almost as strong as a mat board. Or actually, I would say it's even stronger than a mat board. So this is a great material to substitute for mat boards. Um, one of the keys to doing this type of work is organization because as you probably know the most the biggest problem we have in trying to work green is is managing of stuff so a lot of times you have so much stuff you don't know where you put it and then you buy it again and that's a super big problem that's for, both for shops for studios, for all kinds of businesses, and you end up just buying and buying and buying. And so part of this, you know, part of this idea is that we're actually very aware and very organized in our, in our supplies. In order to do that, um, you have to develop some kind of system. And so the system that I've chosen is this type of system. So these are, these are boxes. So this is a small, uh, an extra or a mini small working box. So anything that is of this size, and this size is about, I don't know, six by six and maybe uh, uh, two inches tall. So this has all the miniature stuff. This sits on my desk so I can access it readily all the time. Next one. This is called the small working box, right? So this, this is a probably three inches tall eight inches across and maybe seven inches deep. This has a whole bevy of working supplies. So every off cut 
every, um, you know, as you're starting to go through all building your model, all your pieces and parts, they all get put back at the end of the day, end of the day, they get put back into one of the boxes, depending on their size. Sometimes you have something that's a little bit too big and cut it down so it fits into the box, or it might go up to the next size box. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to take the computer there and get a sense. Okay, there we go. So this next one is the large working supplies box. It's much larger. It's probably about six inches tall by 18 inches deep and maybe about 10 inches across. You can see it compared to the other two boxes. And then right down here, pardon me for a second, you'll see an extra large working supply box. So this is for the stuff that's maybe up to 24 inches tall by 18 inches wide. Because you're dealing with sizes that are not your average size, um, being able to find them in your studio, super key. Okay, I'm gonna show you a little bit how, um, how we use the supplies. So, first off, um, I don't do, I do very little drafting in model making. Um, start by building the model. Like start right away in the model with actually very little idea um, besides a ton of research. Um, what this does is there's nothing pre-planned. So it's, it's a very intuitive process. I'm not saying this works for everybody. Um, however, it's, um, it is a way to sort of uh, work and understand materials in a different way. Um, I also don't paint too many models. Um, a lot of times, um, most of the times, it's a Photoshop texture that's printed on um, either a plain paper or a photo paper. And then sometimes it has some things applied to the top, like some airbrush surfaces, um, some sprayed surfaces, some glazing. Um, but primarily it is, it is actually the, the paper, you know, it is how the paper looks. So this is an example of a photo uh, a photo texture, Photoshop photo texture. This is, it's in scale. It's like a linoleum that's in scale. Uh, here's a brick. So this is all half inch. I tend to work in half inch models, but a quarter inch, you can do the same technique as well. Um, I'm gonna scoop my camera down so you can just see how this is done. Let's bring some light on the situation. Okay. And the reason why I'm showing you how it's done is that with everything, we just sort of, it's not exactly how you would do build a model in a traditional way. It's just slightly different, but it's not crazy different. Okay, so this is a material, I believe this is, it's like one of those um, slips that come in a photo paper packet. Um, one, of the one of the great things about recycled material is you, it always has this color. It'll either be brown, gray, um, it'll have a color that um, is not that. Whenever you have that white um, color, you know it's been it's gone through some other extra process. Like for this, there's some white coating um, that has a you know has a gloss finish. So I actually try to look for things that don't have this whenever possible. But this side is perfect. All right, I'm gonna take my paper and my Elmer's glue. You can also use Sobo. Um, I just like to use Elmer's. The key with this is getting enough glue on your paper for it to stick perfectly, but not too much that it's gonna ever soak through your, uh, your paper, particularly if you're working with inkjet paper. Okay, so you can kind of see that where it's, it's relatively um, thick. And then I'm gonna take my finger. Um, you're welcome to use a brush if you prefer. I always start in the middle because the outsides will dry uh, faster than the inside because of the way moisture, um, you know, if it's not wet next to wet, it stays more moist. But because we're having the dry leading edge, we're gonna do it like this. Okay, so the reason I'm using Elmer's glue as opposed to something like um, twin tack or cello mount or, you know, that double-sided sticky paper, because if you think about that paper, which a lot of people have used, and that's what I was taught to use, um, it has, one piece of trash on one side and another piece of trash on the other side. So you end up with two pieces of trash 
for a product that sticks something to a surface. And then on top of that, you you think about the 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 everything that went into producing that sticky piece of paper. And then ultimately it's not recyclable after that because of that sticky piece of paper. So the reason for this is you don't have any of those things, right? You use a recycled material or sorry. Yeah. Recycled, I guess, you know, this, this is a cereal box basically. Um, Elmer's glue, which is very, very non-toxic and then photo paper which um you know of, uh, of the things in the world it's it's not as good as regular paper you know that you can recycle very easily this does have some glossy finish so you know but it's probably um, one of the better options this is one of the reasons why i don't add a lot of acrylic paint to these substrates it makes them very easily recyclable okay so i'm just going to lift that up so there it is. One of the keys, so every single area was, was touched. There were no holidays. And if you know what I mean by holidays, there was no area that wasn't, did not have glue on it. Because what happens if you have an area that doesn't have glue, it um, later when you're cutting this, it could come up. And then you'll have to go back in and you have to add more glue. And so it's, it's really easy. It's better just to get as much of it glued as you, you can from the get-go. A lot of times what I'll do is then flip this over and put a flat book on it. So it has a tendency to uh, flatten out. Um, one of the things with this technique is that um, you can have curling, right? So curling means the, the substrate does that. And so that's why when you add, have your flat book, particularly if it is upside down on your table with your flat book, you, um, it'll dry evenly all the way across your surface and, um, and it should be fine. If you leave it on your table, uh, with nothing on top of it, you might start to see a curl. So, so uh, just a warning for that. This is everything on the, you know, there's, there's slight differences between your traditional materials. And what I'm trying to do is just give you some of the warnings on these, um, what's different about these non-traditional materials. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you how I organize these, these papers, because same thing with, the, with the, um, the substrates, you end up with so many of these things. You don't want to throw them away. You don't want to recycle them because you've actually put time and energy. You've created your own, um, basically, catalog of materials. Um, and that's something that you could use, continue to use for years. Um, so I, I recommend um, starting some kind of system. I'm going to show you my system. I'm going to move the computer over here to the window so you can get a sense of what that is. Bring it a little closer. Okay, so what you're looking at here are several Bibles. I call these Bibles. They are, uh, they're all listed um, by what they have in them. So this is specialty, specialty papers, clear plastic, metallic, glitter, velour, plastic screen, patterned papers, color papers, green, blue, and purple, dressing, Kitchen, exterior, commercial, exterior, res residential, backstage, store, laboratory, unsorted. Um, brick, stone, concrete in model textures. Um, more colored papers. These are the things that happen in the basement. Neutral papers. I'm going to open up one of these Bibles and you can see. You can see how many, there, how many are in this. Get the curtain off of here. You can kind of see there. So you end up with tons and tons of paper. So this just goes in a closet. And whenever I'm starting to work on a new project, I just pull out, pull out something that I think I'm going to be interested in. So I'm going to get one of these Bibles and we can take a look. Let's just do colored paper right now. This is pretty. OK, so. This is an example of all the blue papers. It's in sheet protectors, blues and greens. Um, they're organized by their colors, you know, pretty much. I mean, it's not perfect by any stretch, but I always know where to find things. Rarely do I have to buy things because I already know where they are. This is another one. So this has all the different colors that are in the basement. Um, so I don't have to store the larger sheets in the studio. 
but there's a, we always know where they are. Okay, so we got your reds, yellows, oranges, all in sheet protectors. By having so many options, it's always sort of a go-to. It's like, um, I'm never sort of at a loss for what is that color, because usually you can find something pretty similar to what you're thinking of in your head. I'll show you one more of these. This one is, let's see, this one is stone. Stone, concrete, and tile. Okay, so things like this. Different types of tile, color tile, bricks. More bricks, tons of bricks. Now we're getting into, um, I think some steel surfaces. Some marbles. Floor tiles. Linoleums, like I showed you earlier. More, this is uh, like subway tiles and more linoleums. So you kind of get the sense of this little bitty tiles, you know, kind of goes on and on. It's endless how many different, different um, textures you can have. Okay. All right, I'm gonna talk just quickly about cardboard. Uh, cardboard, I use for building all the model houses. Um, I'm going to show you, always use this U-Haul uh, type box. Um, this box actually is a little bit thicker than U-Haul. I'm not sure it, where it came from. You know, a lot of these boxes come from things that I might order and have delivered or I find on the sidewalk or um, a whole bevy of things. Um, the great thing about this two-ply cardboard is um, you can get in very large sheets. U-Haul uh, sells them in, they're the large wardrobe box. So I believe it's about I think it's seven feet by three feet or so. Um, and I believe it's about $10 for that. Um, I usually get a zip car and then go pick up several at a time or, you know, zip truck and uh, bring them over. Cause I don't, you know, we don't have a car here and, and don't like to get them delivered. Um, okay, I'll show you how to, how to attach these uh, two, two pieces together. So hot glue gun, I like this type. Um, it's a more um, heavy duty kind, um, but the other ones, you know, the more, um, you know, the kind you get from Lowe's or something are pretty good too. Um, the only thing I would say is don't use, to get some light on the situation, um, don't use those little small ones with the small sticks. I like using these larger sticks. Um, the smaller ones just can't produce enough glue. So it just takes a little bit to get used to this type of work, um, but maybe if you've been doing props for a long time, it's fine. So what I'm doing right now is, is putting the, gluing the edge. Whenever I deal with cardboard, I always use hot glue. Now I'm going to stick it to the back. It just needs to sit for um, a little bit, not very long. I don't know, maybe, um, maybe a minute. The thicker the glue, the longer you have to wait. But the thicker that you apply the glue, the stronger it's going to be. Okay, that's pretty good. So you can see, I mean, there's a slight angle to my table, so that's why you have that angle. So this is how I would start the box. Um, a lot of times I'll go back depending on where, if it's gonna be a visible seam, I'll go back and add a little, um, kind of like a, oh, oh, a, um, what do you call it, a, so a soldering, uh, you know, well, or weld right here on the front, because that, just having that little extra glue makes it a little bit more sturdy. So then from this point, I'll cover the surfaces. Um, there's no, no surface that I won't cover with the paper. So say this was going to be a theater, um, this would then get covered with the, the texture that the theater has. So if it's a black, a black, uh, black box, I would do a black paper. And for black paper, I like to use, um, actually, I can show you real quick. Hold on. I 
I buy this. It's um, 80 pound, I believe, black cardstock. Um, and I get an 11 by uh, 17 sheets and 250 at a time. So it's uh, it's like the per perfect black paper for so many different applications. I can't tell you how much I use this black paper for masking for every single thing you can possibly need on a daily basis. That black paper comes in completely handy. And the reason why I like to buy things in bulk, it's not only is it cheaper, it's better. The less times you have to actually go and buy something or have something delivered, whatever it is. I mean, part of this thinking about sustainability is actually just creating better systems, right? Better systems for yourself, better systems for your students if you have any, if you're an educator. Um, I mean, part of the reason, you know, it's not only sustainability for the reason why I started work this way, it's also for um, financial reasons. Um, and, you know, we're, we, we are in a, a, a world now that we, you know, there's nothing that's, everything is so interconnected. And I really do believe that, that social justice and environmental justice, are, they go hand in hand. And so part of what we do as uh, in the theater is, it, this takes a lot of money actually, you know? And, you know, one of, the, I, I particularly didn't have a lot of money when I was, you know, I was a younger person. And so I kind of needed to make some, some different choices for myself when I was in school. And yet, you know, there, there is this idea that you have to have these expensive materials and you have to do it this certain way. And so I think actually working with these types of materials that you can are basically free, it allows a lot more people in. It allows people um, to have access to this kind of work. Um, so I think particularly for, for new, younger designers and newer designers, giving them the ability to work creatively with different and alternative materials is, is a way for us to, to sort of break down some of the barriers that we've had in the theater with um, them ultimately being maybe all white spaces. Um, and I think that is something that is, is very important for us to start thinking about how do we change that? How are the many, many ways that we can really start to change that? Um, okay, one other thing I'm going to talk about briefly is, is um, organizing your model pieces. After, after you build all this stuff, you got to also then do something with it, right? So you, you do your show. Um, one way is you could just recycle everything. Um, I prefer to keep everything. I don't want to keep it in the box itself because I believe these are not, we are not, our, uh, we weren't, none of us are going to be in museums, right? These things are just going to sit in our shelves or sit in our closets. Um, or you reuse the pieces. And so I've chosen to reuse the pieces. We call it the model graveyard. And I've got the model graveyard behind me. I'm going to show you just some of it. This is actually probably a quarter of what of the model graveyard. Most of it is downstairs in the basement. I just brought some boxes up here for you to see. I'll just give you a little tour of the model graveyard. Whoops. Sorry about my cords. Okay, so you can see these are boxes, um, custom built boxes all out of uh, cardboard and they're all labeled. So these are the types of things I have in them. So these are half inch drops and hanging scenic units, half inch benches, chairs, sofas and tables. Um, this one has all kinds of stuff, half inch counters, bars, fireplace, stuff with wheels, beds, shelves, cabinets ladders, unusual large units, um, unusual dress, half inch, unusual dressing, musicians, mics, stands, furniture, bundles, boxes, suitcases, um, instruments, clothing, wigs. Right here, half inch scale figures and audience seating. I'm just going to show you sort of what this looks like inside. So these are all half inch figures. This is one of two boxes that has all half inch figures in it. Anytime I start a show, I can I start by looking for other scale figures that I might have already built. The next box over here is half inch floors, fences, railings, soft goods, stage lights, speakers, and projections. Like I said, there are many, 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 many more of these boxes downstairs. Most of the time, they are organized like this, so that you have they're labeled, um, and I can easily find things. So whenever I start building a model or designing something, I just use, I pull out the stuff that I already have. So here's an example of some of this furniture. This has been beat up a million times. Its base was black, was matte board that was, I think it was black matte. 
Um, but everything else in here is made out of cereal box or pizza box. And it's covered with the, those types of papers. Just for you, I'll show you a couple pieces. Here's a little, oh yeah, here's a little chair. So there's a little uh, soldered uh, lawn chair with our patterned paper. Here's a little tablecloth. And it has all the different uh, little foods on there. So a little table. So every single thing you see in this box was built that way. A little table like that. Let's see, I'll show you one more box. How about this one? This is our very first one we ever did, and so you'll see foam core, because <laughs> we were trying to use up all the foam core. This is box is probably about, probably 10 years old now. So um, it, you can just stack as so many different things. You can kind of see the things that are in here. Musicians, boxes, suitcase, stores, bundles, flags. I mean, you know, just name it. Every single project gets uh, broken down and then put into the boxes. So, oh, I'll just show you a couple models. I have a couple models here in the studio. Get, I gotta get a little closer. So here's a model that was built this way. This is a lot, has a lot of um, the glossy photo paper. And here's another model. Let's go like that. It was all built this way as well. Um, the last, last thing, because I know we're running out of time here, but I want to talk a little bit about lighting. So, um, use LEDs to light all the models. The reason for it, they're very, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're great. They don't take up much of a, a environmental footprint. They are the perfect color. They're the perfect size. So my associate, Bradley Worley, um, has been developing these. So we started off by just having um, simple LEDs that we glued to a stick and then wired them up and uh, plug them in. We've now, um, he's now developed these 3D printed uh, versions of the thing. So we three, he 3D prints the um, base. On the, this happens to be a, um, uh, let's see, is this a foot light or a, a, a cyclite? light? I think this might be a cyclite. light, yeah. And um, so it has, so basically it's like this. You've got one of these, I believe this is the controller. Yeah, this is the controller for the RGB. So whenever you have, we use both uh, the warm whites and the, LED, the colored L, uh, RGBs. So the RGBs have the four prongs, if you can kind of see that, the four, and the whites have two. I don't have a white on me right now, but um, it comes with a power cord. Yes. An extension cord, like this. What the extension cord allows you to do is, is extend your light. So if you have a light, say you want to extend your booms, you have a, uh, a downstage right boom and a downstage left boom, side light positions, and you want to have them controlled on the same, same dimmer or the same line, you take the extension cord, you use that. So what I'm trying to get at is you use very little power because you can get almost your entire model lit with one power source. So you can have, um, and the reason how you, how you can do that, sorry, I left this important part off. This are the splitters. So one, you put your extension cord into here. And now I'm gonna plug this into my power cord like this. And then I'm gonna plug one of these into my light. Use this one. And then I can, I can power one light and I, I have three more. So I can also add three more um, lights to this. So both of the models that you just looked at, I have two power cords for each light. So that is, I would say in the one model, you probably saw, hmm, gosh, you saw foot lights, two overhead lights, four boom positions, 
and a psych light all on, on two power strips. And for this over here, this model, you saw uh, same thing, two side positions, one overhead, one, two psych, one foot light, and maybe a couple other scatterings with just two power cords. So the idea is little tiny lights, little tiny power, or, or far less power. I think I've got, I've covered the basics. So I want, would love, I mean, there's tons and tons and tons of stuff to talk about, but I actually think y'all have really interesting questions and then we can keep the dialogue going. So um, why don't you unmute yourself? Let's try to do some unmuting and, um, and I wanna hear some of your questions. That's great. Thank you, Danielle, for sharing all of that. Um, for those of you who've joined us before, we often put questions in the chat, but we are shaking it up this time. So I think there's a small enough group here that we can unmute at will. Um, anyone wants to jump in? David, do you have a question? Do you want to go ahead? No? <clears throat> Excuse me. No, I just unmuted in case I do. No. <laughs> well, I can yeah, I can see all of you. If somebody wants to throw a hand up, anyone? Go ahead. You know what? This, here's why. Here's why I need you to talk to me because this is sustainability is about the conversation. We we help each other, and so I actually need you to ask me the questions. Edward, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, thanks so much for this, Danielle. And. Uh, I, I apologize in advance if you already answered this. I had to take uh, a phone call during part of the presentation, but I've, I've done it with you several times, so I think I know a lot of it. I'm curious about how you use your models as like um, an inspirational tool with the uh, with like the production team when you get there um, about how you tell them and how and how you help change people other than like set designers' minds about you know if I can work sustainably, then you can as well. Uh, if you could talk a little bit more about that, that'd be awesome. And just a good question, um, Edward. You know, I don't, when I present these models, um, n no one knows or cares that it's built out of cardboard. I mean, well, I'm sure because you see the side of it and you can see that it is. Um, no one has ever asked about it. And this is any level of theater, you know, from regional to Broadway. I mean, it's just, it's a completely acceptable way to work. So I actually don't, it's not, I mean, I think I, I'm sort of known for, for talking about sustainability in reference to, um, to set building and it's specced all over the drawings, very particular, you know, I choose different materials. I choose materials that, um, I mean, just more sustainable materials from the get-go. But I think with, when it comes to the model, it's not something that is, uh, is really talked about. When you're uh, working with the scenic artists and you present your uh, model because you've been working from Photoshop, what sort of relationship do you anticipate from your, your visual you know, artists in terms mm -hmm. of replicating your look? Yeah, so two things. Um, so I do add glazing to the to the model. So when you say the Photoshop isn't isn't straight up, um, there is some stuff added. So it doesn't. It actually starts to look exactly the way I want it to look on stage. There's um, both with the adding of of um, layers in Photoshop. So a lot of times we just add that sort of spray, you know, the spray look into Photoshop to kind of tone things down. A lot of times I do use some glossy wood tone or use airbrushing um, of inks. To kind of get that scenic look, um, I you know I was a scenic artist for eight years, and so I think with paint, and um, I also spec out every single paint layer in the drafting, and for two reasons, um, I want to make sure that that they budget the paint correctly, and I found um, over the years that if I don't, I'm not really super specific about paint in the drawings, um, it's not adequately budgeted, and then you know, then it's a battle because it's like, oh, well, if you didn't budget the time. So a lot of times adding that extra, all those paint steps means that um, it costs more. Um, often my sets do cost more. And then what happens is I have to cut things. But like that's part of this process. Part of the process is understanding and making different choices. And so um, it, one of those things is just being very specific about paint. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. 
How much do you decide ahead of time um, what materials you want to use and how much of that becomes part of the process uh, during build? During, are you saying uh, the model build or for the set build? For the, for the set, from model to set. You know, I think what happens generally, it's um, there's not, the model is separate, somewhat separate process so that the designing happens through the model and then afterwards, afterwards you sort of figure it out, um, what works, what feels like the model. I try to actually, like a lot of times you'll see my models and you'll see what's on stage and it's exact, like it's exactly the same. So there's not a predetermination during the design process of what it's gonna be. Usually though the model would take, could take two to three to six months. The drafting is done in two weeks after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Eva. Um, I was wondering, I see you're able to keep the models, but what happens to the set when the show is over? Do you get to keep it or do you just tear it down and recycle it? Yeah, that's a great question. I personally do not get to keep any sets. I have limited space here in New York City. You know what? This is something the Broadway Green Alliance has been working on for years. Um, we do a lot of sets on Broadway are recycled. They're broken down into pieces, different pieces and parts, and taken away um, by, I believe, uh, Aguilera. Is that correct? Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But Aguilera uh, is one of a New York company that. Um, We'll pick up steel, you know, we separate it into steel, into wood, a, very, a couple of various uh, uh, materials. That's, um, that's, you know, there's other places in other cities that have more places to store things. And I know a lot of other cities have like uh, better ideas on this, but New York, um, there's not a lot of storage, unfortunately. I don't know if anybody's on here from Chicago, but Chicago in particular has some really great resources. Um, for what they do with their sets afterwards. And Atlanta too, right, Molly? Is it also Atlanta where they're doing? They're, they're starting to, to work on that challenge, which, sure. you know, is, is a challenge, that exact issue of storage. Um, you know, Charlie, I, I know, do you want to talk about the, the closing green guide? I, you can or I can. Um, I'm happy to, if you'd like. Go ahead. Uh, so the Off-Broadway community held a town hall looking at ways to close green and put together a guide that, at, that looks at what, the, what you have to do in order to have your set properly disposed of with the hierarchy being it's best if it can be reused by somebody. That's the best you can do. Um, if it can't be reused, you don't want it to be in landfill. You want it to be recycled. And the challenges, um, we identified five challenges, timing mismatches of you've got it ready and the other person's not ready to take it, storage, um, inf information flow, uh, transportation, etc. cetera. Um, the short uh, the short conclusion of all of it is if you want to make sure that the set's disposed of well, you have to start planning that early. So uh, when you're putting in your show, you should make a strike plan um, and figure out where it's going to go then uh, rather than trying to figure it out in the rush of, um, in many contexts, an unexpected uh, and soon closing date. Uh, and Danielle's correct that in, in, uh, in New York, the vast majority of the closing shows um, do their returns for all the rented equipment and dispose of the rest with ugly era, which then breaks things down, down to the nut or bolt uh, and recycles it with the effect that when we studied it carefully, somewhere between 85 and 92 percent of the materials were either reused or, or recycled. Um, given the size of the shows, that still leaves a bunch that isn't. Um, I'm going to throw to the comments for a second. Megan, uh, do you want to jump in and talk about uh, working with low and no budget sets, which I think everyone in here can relate to at some point? Yeah, yeah hi. 
Um, I primarily work in burlesque and immersive theater and children's theater. Um, the children's theater I work with through the St. Louis Public Library and we're a new program so we also have a low budget so the overwhelming majority of things that we use especially with the burlesque productions I do are found objects. We go dumpster diving and alley surfing and um, so I, no I just I really do appreciate seeing more people especially on the professional end of things using found materials and uh, conserving and reduce reuse. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's so many ways that you can reuse things, right? It, it's uh, whether you're using them on the stage or whether you're using reusing things just in, in your home. It's just figuring out these systems that work best for you. I think, the, you know, it's it's asking the question, right? That's what, part of the reason why I'm asking you, you to ask questions is like, how can you ask the question to yourself? What, what is the thing that you know? Like, it's kind of good to identify, well, what's the thing that you do that maybe, maybe you could change? Like, like who uses foam core? Does anybody want to, like, raise your hand if you use it. I have. Yeah. So, so that's, part of it is just sort of first identifying the materials that maybe are not the best for the environment. And um, Zapagap is, is not great for yourself, you know, your health. Foam core is not great for the, for, you know, our landfills. It's just thinking about that, thinking about everything, all the choices that we make. Okay. Somebody have a, uh, I want to ask somebody else a question. Do you, so let's see, Holly, since you said you did use foam core, um, what do you think about using something else? Like the idea of cardboard, what, how does that sound to you? Well, I'd already encountered that um, and had that realization uh, when I was trying to figure out if I could recycle foam core. I was going through all of the lists and I was, you know, cleaning the studio and discovered that I couldn't. So I was already um, trying to figure out uh, that dilemma. And I, I do collect, you know, cardboard and, and boxes and things for, for other bits and pieces and try and use found objects in models. Um, and haven't really purchased model supplies in a long time, whether it's just the, the buildup in my studio, but specifically foam core I've been trying um, to get rid of and definitely will will move to cardboard. And I've used that in tons of projects and yeah, built sets or props out of it. And it's incredibly strong, especially with hot glue. So it's, you know, makes so much sense. We all get shipments in it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Does yeah. anybody else have a material that they identified that they would like to, um, I like to brainstorm on a less than desirable material, environmentally desirable material. We had a, a question. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, I had a question. Uh, did you have uh, any uh, ways of using non recyclable plastics uh, in your model making? Um, that's as a, as a way of keeping them out of landfill. Yeah, right. Um, plastics. So, you know, I'll use things, um, I found lids to sushi containers to be really great material. Um, I use them for windows, for glass panes and doors, and they uh, work really well um, through the laser, it turns out. So you can laser that type of plastic. A lot of plastics are not good in the laser cutter. They'll sort of melt or turn a weird color. But, uh, or just like not even, you can't get anything out of them. So uh, the sushi lids are, are one of the things I use almost all the time. Um, you know, some other materials are like wax papers and parchment papers. That's not really, those are all recyclable. Those are not recyclable. Um, but, but of course it's the thinner ones. I don't I tend to use the thicker things. There's a little bit, although, you know, it's funny. Part of this is just like you learn as you go. And so one of my students over at Brooklyn College, she did her, she did a swimming pool in the backyard of the, her design. And she took one of those, um, tupper, you know, the food delivery containers and that was her swimming pool. And it was really great. It was totally effective. She put some blue gel in there and some LEDs underneath and it was completely, it just looked just like a pool. So wow. what happened, particularly during COVID. So of course, of course we did both at NYU and uh, Brooklyn College, we did Zoom sessions for the, you know, half a semester. And um, a lot of, you couldn't get very many materials, right? All the art stores were closed. Like, you know, people were, if they were ordering things from Amazon, it was like, you couldn't get it for weeks. So I watched the students improvise their final project continually. 
Um, and it was amazing. I learned so much by the things that they brought in. I just never would have thought about some of the, you know, a washcloth for a rug. Um, I can't remember all of them, but there was just really super smart. Oh, what was it? Egg carton. You know, the egg carton, the clear egg cartons. That the became, plastic ones, yeah. Yeah, the plastic ones became um, a clock, like the very curved clock faces for mm -hmm. uh, uh, a uh, a Grand Central type uh, terminal type clock that somebody had in one of their designs. Mm. So there's a lot of options. You know, you just sort of save stuff. I, you know, I think they'll use those um, coffee bags that are kind of metallic, and that's a good like silver or gold paper. Yeah. Yeah, I actually use uh, the other uh, egg cartons a lot because uh, they separate so beautifully into your sculpting material. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, I'm actually trying to use uh, soft and non-recyclable plastics that usually come in uh, beautiful colors. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to find a way to fuse them so that uh, they would be more rigid and so that they can hold their own shape and be cut. So far, no success on fusing, at least not, not in a non-toxic way. Right. Yeah, a lot of this is, is trial and trial, error, mistake, failure, success, you know? I swear for everything I success I have, I also have two failures. So, or maybe two successes and one failure. So a lot of it is taking the time and be willing to kind of, you know, take some risks. Definitely. Edward, I know you have a question. Oh, well, just sort of uh, added yes anding the, uh, in terms of plastics, a, a good low hanging fruit I found is, uh, if you do go to the art store, is those mammoth Blick or Utrecht bags uh, that are pretty thick plastic. And so I, I shared a design studio with a bunch of much older and much more successful set designers, and they would never hear of using anything other than foam core. But um, I have found that I did get us to start using a recycling area so that we would not, people wouldn't be coming in with these huge bags. And lo and behold, a couple of years in, I find that, yes, the models themselves, uh, they're still often using foam core, but the, um, the boxes and then the boxes within boxes that they're all shipped with ha have, uh, over time, they've seen me save hundreds of dollars a year by just making all those out of cardboard. So um, starting with like how you move stuff around can be a, a, an easy way in. And um, uh, I was just talking with a friend who teaches at Purchase College and um, uh, she, uh, she couldn't attend this, but she was really interested in learning more about this because, you know, as we go into this post COVID world, there's going to be less money for everything. Um, and it's especially hard, like when I went to undergrad, uh, no one would ever think about using anything other than foam core, and it was hundreds of dollars a semester. And so, uh, really, by get it, by normalizing uh, use of found materials is really like a wonderful sort of democratization of um, set design. That's uh, a great thing. So, I hope uh, you. some of you, if people here who work in academia, try and amplify this message, would be great. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. I, I really truly believe in that. And I, just as I look around our room, we do have an all white room here. And, and, and I see that a lot of times in design. And, and that is something that, you know, we, we want to really make sure that we are allowing more people into this place. This is not a place, uh, you know, designing should not be an expensive endeavor. Um, we all know the pay is low, um, but let's not make it more expensive on ourselves by, you know, making, making the industry buy expensive, non-sustainable materials. What about uh, Justin? What do you talk about some of your practices? Oh, well, everything that you, you know, and as, as you're, uh, as this is, thanks you so much for, for this whole conversation. I feel like I, I, two of us are literally staring at our little studio space right now, which is like stream, like we were like, like we're in the process of kind of organizing through it now. So I think just seeing kind of how you kind of started organizing things, it's always, it's nice to, to know that, and that period is someone else's, uh, workspace and kind of see how how what practices you're using and I feel like probably this weekend as we jump into like reorganizing and we have some shelves that we're going to build in there to kind of like um I feel like we're I feel like this is all going to be super useful as we like try to figure out like how we can take all of this and kind of apply it to our own work yeah exactly yeah exactly when you start organizing your materials and developing a system that really works for you where you know where everything is and then you'll see it's like because another part of it is like you want to streamline your time, your energy, right? Figure out how. And one other question, just because I feel like a lot of like directors and stuff have started. I feel like there, there's almost like a. Um, I noticed a lot of them start asking like, you have like uh, about three D rendering or like they they expect to see a rendering in addition to a model. 
And I'm just curious to know, are you doing any kind of 3D rendering or SketchUp, or are you primarily just working in, through in like actual just building models by hand? Well, you know what, that's a great question because a lot of things are moving 3D. I mean, what, which for, for those of us who are, are not familiar with that, it's a, it's a 3D rendering program. So it allows people to um, do, whereas 2D would be drafting, it really gives you a sense of like the space and you're able to move around in the world digitally. Um, we, this is how I use 3D technology is um, I build a model and then a lot of, and then my associate Bradley Worley drafts it um, in 2D, but then sometimes 3D. We use Rhino, and um, I use it Rhino more so for figuring, not for like presenting um, pretty pictures, yeah. um, but more so sometimes figuring out more complicated spaces and more um, particularly very, I do things that aren't theater as well. And so when you're dealing with more architectural spaces and, um, a bigger bigger entertainment you kind of have to have it does help to have that other viewpoint so it adds an additional viewpoint i don't think it's necessity i would be sad to see models go away because i think there is something really really important about understanding space in a, a, a very three-dimensional way three-dimensional being physically seeing it but we're also in this world where we're presenting via via zoom right i presented to a major client last week via zoom and you know, we, I gotta have, you know, you can't, it's not necessarily, it's just me putting the, the screen in front of the model doesn't actually do it as well. So we've kind of gotten into using Premiere, which, you know, taking photographs um, and then shifting the characters, uh, the, you know, the, the scale figures and the movement of the scenery, just really in short little spurts and then stringing the photographs together in Premiere. So it starts to little, look a little bit more like a, a, a stop frame animation is one way. Um, I do think we are gonna have to all adapt into some other virtual um, arenas. Yeah, I do. But, but, I, but I think there's, what I, here's what I'm excited about. Post COVID, this post COVID world, pre or whatever, we're in a COVID universe, right? Where we cannot be together all the time now is a time where we can be super creative and have to be super inventive about the way we the way we work the way we communicate and what kind of changes that we can instill or help instill in our in the theater and in elsewhere great thank you danielle totally. um, thank you sabrina for a great suggestion in the chat um i'm aware that we are at two o'clock um, and we do try to end promptly, uh, so I will I will close us out. Um, Danielle, is there anything else you want to leave us with before I wrap us up here? I'm just looking at the the chat. I'll have to take a look at that. Um, no, I'm super excited that that all of you are interested in this and that you're spending you know some of your time to to learn about it. And I just hope that you you know try it, try it for yourselves and figure out what kind of systems might work for you and. Um, you know, you're always welcome to reach out to me if you have specific questions. And also just one of the greatest things you can do is start to have this dialogue with your community, um, either if you're at a school or if, you know, any type of group that you could have. I mean, one of the things that we have here, I mean, we have, like Edward and I are in a, a Facebook group where are full of designers. And so we talk about things, you know, if you have groups of designers that can talk about, um, I use this material or um, I use this, this uh, different substrate on stage. It, it gives you an opportunity for these conversations. And I think the key to sustainability is having conversations about it and talking and sometimes repeating yourself over and over again. So um, I thank you for attending this and um, spread the word. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, this was absolutely incredible. As usual, I learned so much from you in this hour. I'm really excited uh, to put this into place and to um, see what all of you on the Zoom create. If you create models or anything during this time or going forward with any of these new techniques, please share them with us. Send us emails, tag us on social media. We would love to see what you do with these new techniques and how you put them into place in your work. Um, that would be really thrilling for all of us, certainly from Danielle, I'm sure. Um, so please share back. Join us again. I'm going to make a plug for something that we are not hosting, but that we will be at. And Danielle, I believe you're moderating tonight, um, which is an event at Wing Space, uh, which will be all about sustainable production, including uh, lots of conversations about sustainable scenic techniques. This is geared a lot toward production managers and production 
Um, so join us there tonight at Wingspace, 7 p.m. Um, and then join us again next Thursday. We're here every Thursday at Green Quarantine, 1 p.m. Next Thursday, we will be talking about climate restoration uh, with a fantastic panel all about doing a little bit of climate literacy, learning about how we can restore our planet, um, and with some fabulous, fabulous youth activists, including a college green captain from uh, our own program. So please join us next week. Uh, otherwise, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, thank you for sharing uh, your expertise with us today. Thank you to all of you for spending this hour with us. And we will see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody.